Well, good morning. I want to thank the elders for their interest in this topic today. This is a topic that is facing our children. Our children are being faced with this in secular education, entertainment, and in other ways. And we as adults also are being faced with this. And I think there are many ramifications that people don't think about that we will talk about later tonight. We will also talk about the justification for why we need to have presentations like this and studies like this tonight. This morning is a little bit lighter lesson. And in this lesson, we will, it'll be a very graphically filled lesson. I just want to prepare you for that. But so in this first lesson, on the background of neo-Darwinian evolution, we're going to study micro versus macro evolution in animal kinds. And um, the first thing we need to say is that today you're going to learn a principle that will help you, enable you to answer, I think, about 90% of all evolutionary arguments that you are faced with will be dealt with in this lesson today. But let's remember that when we are dealing with people that we disagree with, let's be sure that we have the proper demeanor, the proper Christ-like, godly attitude, that we're not out to win an argument. We're out to change minds and convince people about the love of our Lord Jesus Christ coming to this earth to die for us. And with that in mind, I want to look at a few passages and we often quote 1 Peter 3.15, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. Oftentimes we end there, but look how the verse ends. Yet with gentleness and reverence. Galatians 6.1 applies to brethren, but I think equally well it can apply to those who are non-believers in our spirit or attitude in which we treat them. Brethren, even if anyone is caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Each one looking to yourself so that you will not be tempted. And then in 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26, we see an important warning here. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. So let's keep that in mind as we discuss these issues with others. Well, what are we going to learn in this lesson? First of all, the fixity of animal kinds disproves neo-Darwinian evolution. And second, animals can change or vary within their kind, that is microevolution, but not outside their kind. Macroevolution. Well, first of all, let's define terms. What is evolution? Evolution really is macroevolution or neo-Darwinian evolution. We can go into that later. But it's, it's not a science, as we will see tonight. It's really a philosophy that all life on Earth evolved gradually from a single-celled organism by means of random mutations, that is, errors within the genetic code or mutations in the DNA, as well as natural selection or survival of the fittest, where those that are most fit out-compete and leave more offspring than those that are left fit and thus evolve up Darwin's tree of life. But this idea of macroevolution is not anything new. It's not just since Darwin in 1859. It's been a strongly held philosophical conviction for thousands of years before man ever tried to make it scientific. It is really a philosophy which we call an a priori philosophy. That is, the conclusion precedes the experiments. Science is supposed to work the other way around, a posteriori, where the experiments uh, precede the conclusion. We'll talk more about that tomorrow afternoon. Well, how do we know macroevolution was accepted before it was scientifically tested? Well, a man that lived shortly after Charles Darwin, Dr. Lewis Trenchard Moore at the University of Cincinnati said, our faith in the idea of evolution depends on our reluctance to accept the antagonistic doctrine of special creation. We can't believe in creation, so we have to come up with another idea. 
H.F. Osborne from Harvard said, from the earliest stages of Greek thought, man has been eager to discover some natural cause of evolution and abandon the idea of supernatural intervention in the order of nature. In fact, man has been trying to explain God away at least for 3,000 years, hasn't he? Psalm 14, 1 and 53, 1, the fool has said in his heart there is no God a thousand years before Christ. If there is no God, then we have to have an alternative explanation for how we got here in the first place. Thus, as was said by Dr. Osborne, even the Greeks back to Thales in 588 B.C. and Anaximander in 570 B.C. proposed different mechanisms of evolution. Evolution was also proposed just prior to Charles Darwin in his day by others that tried to come up with some uh, mechanisms. One of the more popular ones is the first one here, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, that came up with Lamarckianism, which was similar to Charles Darwin's idea of pangenesis and gemules that we can talk about later. Others were Alfred Russell Wallace, St. Hilaire, Robert Grant, and even Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus Darwin. Well, what was the significance of Charles Darwin then? Well, Charles Darwin very eloquently and carefully used, whether he knew it or not, used what is called a logical fallacy in argumentation. The fallacy of equivocation, also known as bait and switch, to say if animals can vary within their kind, that is various types of pigeons, types of dogs, various... Uh, varieties of cats, of pigs, of cattle, then they can evolve outside their kind into different kinds. Kind of like how uh, Lucy used to hold the football for Charlie Brown and right before he got there she would pull it away. That's what Charles Darwin did to us. And the fallacy goes like this. I know evolution, my, microbe to man or molecule to man is true or particle to people is true because we see evolution, dogs turning into different varieties of dogs all the time. But that's a non sequitur. Those are different concepts, macro versus micro evolution. Darwin, in fact, proved survival of the fittest, but in order to prove macro evolution, he had to approve arrival of the fittest. Where do these animals come from in the first place? So back to the starting slide, the microevolution maxim simplified, animals can vary within their kind, microevolution, but not outside their kind, macroevolution. And I think 90% of the arguments that people will give you are going to fall into this category. You might say, well, is this a biblical concept? I think so. Look at Genesis, the first chapter, in verse 21. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their species? No, according to their kind. And every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Verse 24, then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind. Kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth, each according to its kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Now the word kind comes from the Hebrew word men, kind. And created kinds is called a baramen. Therefore, there is a study called baraminology or baraminology that studies what were the original kinds that God created at the beginning, that varieties have come from. Baraminology, it's a creationist taxonomic system that divides animals into these groups or baramins and it claims that differing kinds cannot interbreed and have no evolutionary relationship to one another. Now, what Charles Darwin said is everything evolved from a common ancestor in the form of this, Darwin's tree of life, with the least diversity on the bottom and the greatest diversity at the top as it evolves over time. But as we will talk about more tonight, you actually have to turn this tree on its head to see what we see in the fossil column. All the way at the bottom in the Cambrian layer, you see the greatest 
diversity, not the least diversity. In fact, there is more and more diverse phyla at the bottom in the Cambrian layer than even exists today because many have become extinct. So what we really see is this bottom picture. What you see here is not a tree of life, but a forest of life where God made each kind individually distinct, but notice within each kind there are branching varieties, branching variants that come out, but they are still the same kind. But over time, do we see more or fewer of these? Evolution says we should see more of these. And yet over time, we see an elimination or a reducing process in which animals are becoming extinct. One to 100 animals and plants become extinct every day. So let's use some examples. First of all, there are over 1,300 varieties of roses. Now did all these roses exist in the beginning? Well, you would like to think so, they're so beautiful and different, but no, we know that they didn't. Why? Because man has selected for all these. The first rose from which all these varieties came from had to have all the genetic information to create these various types of roses. Man has selected for aroma and size and color and petal thickness. So we're not seeing them change into any other kind. We're only seeing them vary within their kind, microevolution. So now we're going to have some more graphic slides. Let's ask the question, did all these animals exist in the beginning? This is a family and genus of uh, canids, Canidae canis, coyote, gray wolf, golden jacko, dingo, dingo, Ethiopian wolf, and domesticated dog. Now, were all these in the beginning? Well, we think not. Why? Because they can all interbreed. For example, if you breed a coyote with a wolf, it produces a koi wolf. And most creation scientists, as well as secular scientists, all believe that the canids originated from a wolf-like ancestor. But the point is, they're still the same kind. But you might say, well, I can't believe these are all the same kind. They're so unique and distinct and different. Well, if you think there's a lot of difference between these two, or these six guys, what about these two guys? There's even more difference between these two, but guess what? Even the secular scientists say they are the same species. They're both domesticated dogs. You've not created anything different. God has made these animals with plasticity, if you will. So if they live in the Arctic, they'll have longer and lighter color hair. If they live in Texas, they'll have darker color hair and uh, shorter hair to survive in those climates. And so they all came from a wolf-like ancestor. And someone says, well, that's evolution right there. Well, no. What does evolution require? It requires survival of the fittest. How long would this little dog survive in the wild with the Arctic wolves? Not very long. But you can still see their aggressiveness sometimes come out, that they did come from the same, <laughs> the same common ancestor because they are the same kind, not evolving into anything different. Let's use a few more examples. What about the lion and the tiger? Sometimes in the children's books we see lions and tigers in the Garden of Eden. Were they both, were they both created in the Garden of Eden or did they have a common ancestor? Well, we believe they have a common ancestor. Why? Because they can interbreed and produce their offspring is either a liger or a tigon. Each of them, however, has lost some of the original genetic information from their ancestor such that if you want to go back to the original, you might have to cross them and, and uh, produce this hybrid vigor. In fact, the largest cat in the world is the liger, up to 920 pounds. Well, Science Daily recently had an article in 2021 that talks about a newly identified saber-toothed cat that is supposedly weighing up to 900 pounds. The original cat that the Lord made may have been something as large as that. Well, next, what about the domesticated cat and the caracal? Caracal in North Africa and the Middle East. Well, they are both the same kind because they can interbreed and it produces a caracat. But this does not create any different kinds. It's just varieties within the same kind. What about the horse and the zebra? 
the same thing. You can breed them and produce a zorse or a zebroid. No macroevolution, just microevolution. What about the donkey and the zebra? They may have come from the same progenitor because you breed them and produce either a Z-donk or a donk Z, depending on which is the mother and uh, which is the female and which is the male. Also, the same is true for the polar bear and the grizzly bear. Now, the polar bear has a selective advantage in the Arctic because it's white. It's able to um, hunt better and blend into its habitat. And yet, you can breed both of these, and it produces a growler bear or a pizzly. God made them with this plasticity, if you will. Now, what about the zebra and the rhinoceros? Can you create a rhinebra? <laughs> no, that's not possible. And yet, as I show you a few of these slides, they're kind of humorous. But the point is that as ridiculous as these seem, there are people that have suggested such and believe such. We don't see any bird dogs or fox birds or seal parrots, gorilla crows, leopard squirrels, pug monkeys, bunny birds, or pug horses. But a scientist in the 1980s, a paleontologist named Dale Russell, actually said, as funny as those slides were, that if the dinosaurs had not become extinct, they would have actually evolved into a human-like ancestor or a human-like animal, and some people accept this today. They would have evolved into the dinosauroid, and instead of us building the skyscrapers and going to the moon, it would have been the dinosauroids. This is fed to children in textbooks such as this Dinosaurs Through Time by this author, Rupert Matthews. Is there anything scientific about this? This is pure science fiction peddled as truth, peddled to our children. And should we be surprised? 2 Timothy 3.13 says, But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. And 2 Timothy 3.7 says, Always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now a few more examples. What about the bison and domesticated cattle? You can cross them and it produces beefalo, but this is not macroevolution. It's just variation within a, in a kind. Some of you may be familiar with cattle breeding. Well, there are 14 members of the cattle kind, and all of them could have come from the same ancestor. Now, why are we making such a big point on this? Because we need to make sure Christians understand that there is evolution in terms of microevolution. We need to make sure that we're not making improper arguments, that animals can change, they can vary. In some ways, um, even new species can arise. Actually, a species is, is whatever the experts call a species. That's still very debatable. But they can still be within the same kind. They're not changing into any other kind. So among the cattle kind are the American bison and domesticated cattle, the musk ox, the Cape Buffalo, and we put this Cape Buffalo next to this Holstein bull, you can notice, you can see the similarities there. They came from the same ancestor, we believe. The Auric, now from the Auric that died in 1627, the last female, there are all these variety of, of I believe, 18, 800 different types of cattle. The wild yak, you can cross a wild yak with domesticated cattle and the offspring is yattle. Or you can cross a wild yak with American buffalo and produce a yakalo. There's the Asian banting, the cupre, the gower, European bison, which you can see the similarities with the American bison, the water buffalo, the tamara, Indonesian lowland anoa, and mountain anoa. Now let's go back to this auric which all domesticated cattle came from. Now, the last female became extinct in 1627, but based on what you've learned today from baraminology, how could we go back and reproduce one of these, so to speak, or re remake one? Well, you could combine genes from all the domesticated cattle today and try to produce one. Maybe you cross a uh, 
Angus with a short horn, with a coriente. Well, this is exactly what a Dutch backbreeding project has done. They have selected various species of cattle and interbred them to try to produce this auric. And I'll let you decide if they did a good job or not. But it shows that God has made these animals able to change and adapt within their environment, but they don't change into any other kind. Well, what about these two, the camel and the llama? What's interesting about the camel and the llama is according to evolutionists, they have been separated over thousands of miles for supposedly 11 to 25 million years. Now, uh, also, according to them, when animals are geographically separated and begin inbreeding within their kind, they are no longer able to interbreed with one another. But what do we see? After being separated for 11 to 25 million years, supposedly, they can still interbreed. And it produces what they call is a comma. Now, the point here is that these animals aren't changing into anything different. They, uh, and they still have the ability to breed, so they have not been separated for 11 to 25 million years, maybe a few thousand years at best. Now let's look back at the scripture we looked at in the beginning, Genesis 1, 21, 24, and 25. Let's look at verse 24 and see if this doesn't make more sense to you now. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind. Now you can have different varieties of the kind, but they're still the same kind. Cattle and creeping thing and beasts of the earth, each according to its kind. Therefore, you can have various varieties of finches but it'll still be a finch. Different type varieties of snakes, but it'll all, be a, all will be a snake. A uh, turtle will be a turtle, a bat, a bat, a rat, a rat, a cat, a cat, a dog, a dog, a pig, a pig, a monkey, a monkey, and a man, a man. They will not change into any other kind. Now, the whole point of this lesson is because when teachers give examples in the classroom of different types of evolution, they will often say, well, don't you believe that dogs can be bred for different varieties of dogs? And the child will say yes. And then the teacher will say, well, you believe in evolution then. But what have they just done? Do you remember the bait and switch? They've just switched terms on you. The fallacy of equivocation. So maybe this lesson will help you the next time you're confronted with that. When someone says, well, there's different types or varieties of fruit flies, different varieties of finches, different varieties of dogs, different varieties of pigeons. Um, finally, I have thrown in here some FAQs. I've been asked these questions in various places. There are four FAQs we want to address. So first of all, number one, how did Noah fit all those animals in the ark? Well, first let's look at the dimensions of the ark. In Genesis, the sixth chapter, in verse 14, God said to Noah, Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with rooms and shall cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you shall make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits or 450 feet long. Its breadth, 50 cubits or 75 feet wide. And its height, 30 cubits or 45 feet tall. Now, we believe that it, with a structure 45 feet tall, there may have been different levels or different decks. But if you take those dimensions and work out the area, it works out to over a half a million cubic feet. But that's if there were three decks. Half a million cubic feet per deck. That's a total of 1.5 million cubic feet on the whole arc. That's equivalent to 627 freight carriers or 500 semi-trailers. That would be a line of semis 6.6 miles long. You see how much room there was in the ark? Well, how did they get all the animals in there if there are thousands and thousands of kinds of animals? Well, there may not be thousands or as many as you think of the different kinds. There may be more species, but fewer kinds. In fact, according to baraminology, as we looked at, scientists have narrowed down all the animals into about 8,000 kinds.
sins. So that would be about 6,000, 16,000 different unclean animals that would have gone in the ark. Also, they could have taken juveniles or even eggs. Uh, a dinosaur's egg is only about the size of a football, the largest egg. In fact, with dinosaurs, the average dinosaur is not as big as you think. The average dinosaur is only about 100 pounds or the size of a sheep. But someone will say, but there are hundreds of kinds of dinosaurs. Well, actually, baraminology uh, narrows it down, whittles it down to about only about 40 different kinds of dinosaurs. To illustrate the point, here is an infraorder of dinosaurs called Ceratopsia. Within this, we see 11 different varieties, but all of these animals may have come from the original kind and just um, developed different characteristics, as is done when dogs are bred. In fact, the one with the most phenotypic information, it looks like, phenotypic diversity would be this Pachyrhinosaurus. So maybe that was the original ancestor, we don't know. Well, not point two, question two, what do similarities in human and chimpanzee DNA indicate? This is a frequently asked question. You know, for years we've been told we are 99% chimp, that 99% of our DNA is homologous with chimp DNA. Well, in 2005, the journal Nature had a special issue dedicated to the chimp genome, and they came to the most dramatic confirmation yet. They said there was actually less similarity. We're only 96% related to chimps. And someone might say, well, that's still a lot. Uh, you're still 96% chimp. That must prove evolution. Well, consider this. In the human genome, that is the totality of genetic information in the human body, there are approximately 3 billion base pairs, or 3 billion of these matching nucleotides. Well, actually, 6 billion matching, but 3 billion paired up. Now, when you consider that we are 4% different than a chimp, and if there are 3 billion base pairs, that is a 120 million base pair difference. That's nothing small. That is very significant. Someone might say, well, 4%, 120 million base pair differences. What's the big deal? We're still very close to chimps. Well, here's the significance. One base pair difference produces the disease sickle cell anemia. And you say there were 120 million random differences? It's hard to believe that could ever happen. Further, the evolutionary process supposedly occurred from apes, old world apes, to man evolved in only 13, uh, excuse me, in 6 million years, only in 300,000 generations. 300,000 generations. And they will say, well, that's why we can't see evolution today. It takes too long. We can't see 300,000 generations of humans. Well, can you think of any animal that has a shorter generation time than a human's generation time? How about the fruit fly? It only takes about 10 days to reproduce. Or how about the bacterium? Some bacteria only take 20 minutes or less to, to double or go through another generation. Well, this has been done since the late 1800s. For 140 years now, we've been applying selective pressure to bacteria and causing them to grow and multiply. And what have they produced in 100 and 140 years? Nothing but more bacteria. Yes, various uh, characteristics and traits, but nothing but bacteria. And in fact, in 25 years, a bacterium goes through 657,000 generations. That would be supposedly 13.1 million years in human evolutionary time, and yet the bacteria have not changed into anything other than bacteria. We do not see evolution occurring in nature, macroevolution. Question number three, what about the dinosaurs? 
You know, I, in the past I had almost nothing about dinosaurs, and now I have a lecture, um, a separate lecture that has quite a bit about dinosaurs just because there are so many questions. This is probably the most frequently asked question. Well, what's the significance of dinosaurs in the evolutionary controversy? Well, dinosaurs have been one of the most powerful recruiting tools for evolution. And someone might say, well, as Christians then, what do we do with the dinosaurs? Where do they come into play? Where does the Bible talk about dinosaurs? Well, I believe they're mentioned in Genesis 1.24, where it says all land creatures were created on the sixth day of creation. Notice Genesis 1.24, Then God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle, and creeping thing and beasts of the earth after their kind and it was so and I believe that the dinosaurs must have been created then you might say well then why doesn't the Bible mention the dinosaurs well for a couple of reasons first of all dinosaur fossils were not known to be discovered until 1822 by Gideon Mantell secondly the word dinosaur was not even invented until 1841 by Richard Owen. I would suggest that prior to 1841, dinosaurs were previously known by the name dragon. In fact, almost all cultures in the world today, coincidentally, have dragon legends. Why is that? Why do these diverse and disparate cultures all have these dragon legends? Well, scientists have speculated about this because they can't ignore the fact that all these cultures have dragon legends. Carl Sagan mentioned this in his book, Dragons of Eden. He said, the pervasiveness of dragon myths in the folk legends of many cultures is probably no accident. It is a worldwide phenomenon. Could the pervasive dreams and common fears of monsters which children develop be evolutionary vestiges of responses to dragons? We may be replaying the hundred, year, hundred million year old warfare between the reptiles and the mammals. So he says somewhere in the vestiges of our evolutionarily um, created minds, we have some knowledge about dinosaurs from our ancestors. And so that's why we're afraid of monsters and afraid of giant creatures. And of course, uh, the crea not only the creationists, but the evolutionists uh, pretty much laughed this off. But it is true. Notice some of these cultures uh, that all have dragon legends. The uh, Inuit Indian, Dakota Sioux, Hebrew, Greece, Denmark, Wales, China, Egypt, Iroquois, Poland, Cherokee, Germany, all different parts of the world. You might say, well, where did the Hebrew have a dragon legend. Well, some people think, and dragons are mentioned in the scripture, but some people think in Job 40, 15 through 18, this is discussing a dinosaur. I don't know, but I think it may be suggestive. Let's read here in Job 40, verse 15. Look now at the behemoth which I made along with you. Therefore, the sixth day of creation, he was created. He eats grass like an ox. See now, his strength is in his hips and his power is in his stomach muscles. He moves his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are tightly knit. His bones are like beams of bronze, his ribs like bars of iron. Well, what would a cedar look like in the Middle East that Job might be referring to? It would have looked like this. These are some Middle Eastern cedars. Large, towering, giant trees. When it says he has a tail like a cedar, I think it's indicating one of these large trees. But if you look in some of your study Bibles next to Behemoth, it'll have a footnote and it'll say probably an elephant or a hippo. Well, let's look and see if the elephant's tail looks like a cedar. To me, that doesn't look much like a cedar. That looks more like a uh, cedar switch. What about the hippo? Hippo's tails don't look like cedars either. Not like a cedar here either. So finally on this point, what is the significance of dinosaurs in the evolution controversy? 
Well, listen to what Derek Ager says. He's an anti-creationist and uh, staunch evolutionist. He says, always it comes back to the extinction of the dinosaurs. I must admit to being a little tired of those great beasts, though they are the best recruiting sergeants for our subject among young people, including myself. Their importance, in my view, is grossly exaggerated. My conclusion is, dinosaurs don't prove anything about evolution, only that there were large reptiles that once time, one time roamed the earth. Finally, point four, this has been asked, what about the Ice Age? Did the Ice Age really occur? Well, I would just recommend one website here, um, creation.com, and do a search for Ice Age, and you'll come up with 19 articles that creation scientists have written about the Ice Age, and creation scientists do believe in the Ice Age. In fact, it's hard to deny when you see these uh, glacial tills that... Uh, that created markings through, through rock in the ground. Well, this is how they believe it, it occurred. During the flood, during the flood year, the scripture says the great fountains of the deep were open. There was large volcanic activity, um, giant lava flows in the oceans, and some scientists believe this would have increased the ocean's temperature, the average temperature, to over 70 degrees. This would have created enormous amounts of evaporation going into the atmosphere. Uh, all the volcanic ash from the eruptions would have blocked out the sun, making a colder climate. This moisture would have uh, traveled through to the pole areas and would have come down as copious amounts of precipitation as snow, creating the, uh, the glaciers and the cold land mass. Interestingly, there seems to be possibly a reference to this ice age in the book of Job, who perhaps lived in its waning years. Job, in Job 38, verses 29 and 30, now remember this would have been, we believe, in the Middle East. Job here says, Out of whose womb came the ice and the frost of the heavens? Who fathered it? The waters are hidden like stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. Where do you know in the Middle East today where the water is hidden like stone and the deep is frozen? Look in verse 9 of chapter 37. From the chamber of the south comes the whirlwind, and cold from the scattering winds of the north. By the breath of God, ice is given, and the broad waters are frozen. Where in the Middle East now do you know where the broad waters are frozen? Such questions possibly indicate that Elihu and Job, who spoke in those passages, knew either firsthand or by historical family records about an ice age. This is probably a reference to the climatic effects of the ice age that are not now seen in the Middle East. So those are just a few questions that people have asked. Thank you for your attention this morning. That includes the lesson. I look forward to any questions you might have um, later. I can't say that I will um, be able to answer all those questions, but um, I will certainly try. Uh, okay, there we go. So um, we don't want to conclude without mentioning again, as we did at the beginning of the lesson, our Lord Jesus Christ who created this world, Colossians 1 says, John 1 says, as we'll be looking at later tonight, who not only created this world, but created a plan for us to be redeemed. The Son coming to the earth to die for us and to, to give His life for our, our sins. The Old Testament is a, uh, has a scarlet thread that runs from the beginning of the Old Testament to the end that prepares us for this coming of the Messiah, the Savior, that would redeem us. And in Galatians, the third chapter, in verse 24, it tells us what was the purpose of the Old Testament. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ. When we study the Old Testament, it leads us to Jesus, that we may be justified by faith. So someone says, there it is. All I have to do is have faith. Look in verse 25, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor, 
For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So all we need is faith, right? We'll drop down to verse 27. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We need to believe in Jesus, but we need to submit to him in humble obedience, be baptized, have our sins washed away, Acts twenty two sixteen. We're going to offer that invitation now. For anyone that would like to be baptized, name the name of Christ, confess him as your Lord and as the Son of God, together as we stand and sing the hymn that's been selected. very humbling to uh, answer these questions and I'll just let you know I do not consider myself an expert in this field um, I consider myself a student just like many of you uh, I studied after and learned from many good creation scientists and uh, hope that the things I've learned I might be able to answer some of these questions some creationists believe that God created the universe 14 billion years ago. Is this true? Yes, some believe that the universe was created 13.8 billion years ago and then it evolved and, and the earth was formed 4.454 billion years ago. Um, I, I believe what Genesis 1 says that the earth and all the universe was created in the six literal 24-hour days of creation. Um, there's some material in the back on that. And if you have questions about the scientific um, ideas for a young earth, I have an article that I wrote on the back on radiometric dating and evidences for a young earth from a scientific perspective. Um, let's see here. And if I don't ask your question, approach me afterwards. Um, thoughts on the Pangea? Yes, uh, many people, many creation scientists believe that in the beginning, in Genesis 1, we see it says that God created the, the waters and gathered the land into one place. So originally the land mass may have all been in one place and often many creation scientists believe that this was uh, divided during the, uh, during the uh, flood. What is the difference between kinds and species? Um, is it important for them to have viable offspring? Oftentimes, a species is defined as uh, animals that can reproduce and have, have viable offspring. And so that's true. Um, a kind would be somewhere around the family level. But you have to understand that species is whatever a taxonomist calls a species. It can have some slight differences, and they can call it a different species. Or it can be a, a totally different and distinct kind and they can call it a different species so um, I think that the main point is that anything that can interbreed is probably the same kind and I have a couple here that I'm having a little trouble reading okay if the ice age wasn't a thing where would the glaciers come from well, that's, that's why I believe there was an ice age. There were uh, glaciers. And some people think we're living in, in the end of the ice age, and that's why there is so much um, shrinking of, um, of the glaciers. Now, one more question. I, whoever wrote this, I, I don't quite understand it, so I think I'm going to conclude there. Thank you for watching this video. We're glad that you have found our channel, and in fact, while you're here, we would encourage you to subscribe to the Jones Road Church of Christ channel. We have several videos already up, and we believe you'll find these to be true to God's Word, helpful to you in your journey toward God. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us and let us know how we can help you.